Um, this is a Build Your Own Database, Berkeley DB Java Edition at Yammer. Uh, my name is Ryan Kennedy. I'm on the core services engineering team at Yammer. Um, email address rckennedy at gmail.com, and you can find me on Twitter at rckennedy. Uh, thank you all for overcoming the scaling Pinterest type. Uh, if you're actually looking for the Pinterest talk, you want the second floor. Um, you should totally stay here, though. Um, my goal for today is for nobody to leave this room thinking you should have gone to the other talk, so uh, I'll do my best. Um, so a big question is why, would, why on earth would you want to build your own database today? Um, it's an excellent question. It's one that we asked ourselves repeatedly before we actually did it. Um, it is, strictly speaking, not advisable uh, given the databases available to you today. Um, the most useful thing you can come away from with this talk today is I should never do this. Um, sometimes, however, databases of the day aren't exactly enough for what you're doing. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and why that was the case for Yammer. Um, it can also be fun and somewhat easy-ish. Uh, it really can. Uh, with tools like Berkeley DB that you can go and grab off the shelf, you can sort of dive as deep or as shallow as you want into database specifics. Um, so if you really love assembling things from other things, uh, this can actually be a really enjoyable thing to do. Um, so to give a bit of context, about 18 months ago, Yammer set out to replace our Rails plus Postgres uh, messaging database. Um, we had done a bit of analysis looking at the database and sort of looking at what our, our ramp was in terms of how much space we had left, how much time we had left on the existing system, and we realized we didn't have a lot of headroom left. We had three, six, maybe nine months we really squeezed. And we sort of looked at the problem. We said, you know, we can buy bigger hardware, we could buy more hardware and shard, or we could look for some other technology that we could switch to that would allow us to do more horizontal scaling. Um, and so where we were coming from was a big single instance Postgres database. Uh, at the time that we finally switched off of it, we were somewhere between 10 and 11 billion rows of message deliveries. And we'd really kind of pushed it as far as we could go with it um, in, in, in a single database instance. That was really as far as we were going to be able to go. Um, Yammer, the way that we store things, we store all the feeds materialized. So if you think about a message on most social networks, you send a message, that message ends up going to lots of different users. There's sort of two ways you can do this. You can either go ahead and deliver the message to all the users at the time the message is sent, or you can store the message and construct the feeds whenever they're read. Given that most of our traffic is read traffic and not write traffic, we want to make sure that the read traffic is as inexpensive as possible, so we store all the feeds materialized. The problem with this is that with this high delivery fan out, this can get rather expensive to do. Um, if you think that every network, so every one of our customers has lots of individual feeds. There's a feed for the all company group. There's a feed for all the individual groups. And then you have all the users, and all the users have their own feeds. It, it gets to be quite a large fan out. So doing this, materialized, doing this materialized feed architecture that we have, it gets fairly expensive. And this is where we start to really get in trouble with Postgres. We could have bought bigger hardware. Um, certainly, we're not on the biggest database that we possibly could have bought. Um, we would eventually ended up back in the same situation. You know, how far we kick that can down the road is largely determined at that point by user growth. Uh, for a startup, we want user growth really to hockey stick. We don't want to stifle user growth. We want to encourage that. Um, at the same time, hardware is very expensive, and we're a startup working on a startup budget, and so we don't want to go and blow a bunch of money. So these two things are kind of at odds. We don't want to try and fight the Let's, let's buy big hardware or let's stifle user growth. And so buying big hardware just wasn't really a viable option for us. Uh, we could buy more hardware and partition it. Um, to scale horizontally, we'd really have to take our existing database and break it up into lots of smaller databases. Um, you either then, at that point, build your own partitioning scheme on top of something existing like Postgres, or you move on to something that uh, supports partitioning right out of the box. Uh, we did try a lot of off-the-shelf horizontal solutions. We didn't just jump to building our own. Uh, you know, we're not completely crazy. We didn't just look at this and say, oh my god, let's go build our own database. It sounds like fun. Um, we tried a lot of solutions. I went and dug up a message from uh, Coda Hale, our infrastructure architect, um, that discussed a bit of what we had tried in the past. Uh, we tried Cassandra. We tried Voldemort. We tried some weird combination of Rabbit and Postgres. We tried uh, looking at Postgres and sharding itself. Um, we also made a very serious attempt at using React. Uh, React's one of the uh, uh, sponsors here. They, we had really good success with it on a prior project, and it's built by some really wickedly smart people in databases. They're actually presenting later today. I encourage you to go see their talk. Um, it runs flawlessly with very little operational support, and so we decided that we really wanted to try and move in that direction, and so we built an eventually consistent data model for our messaging database um, so that we could actually put it onto React, and we gave it a try. 
We simulated it with 20 React nodes in EC2 along with the driver node so that we could actually say, let's simulate what it would look like to do a batch of deliveries into React running in a relatively large cluster. Um, it seems a little bit absurd to do any kind of this testing on EC2 uh, when you're gonna go ahead and put it in your own data center, but the fact of the matter is if you can make it run in EC2, you can probably make it run anywhere. Um, so we kind of use EC2 as kind of the low end of the bar. If we could make it run there, we knew we could make it run in the data center. When we actually fired it up, what we see is uh, high fan out writes. So a network with a lot of users in it, say 50 to 100,000 users, um, would consistently generate bursts of 200 megabytes per second of traffic for a single message delivery. Um, this is more than gonna saturate a gigabit ethernet link. Uh, high fan out in this case is, like I said, tens of thousands of feeds. Um, each read from, each, each delivery has to incur a read from the network. So we have to actually go and get the feed, read it in, append the new message into the feed, deal with any truncation logic so that we're not just storing infinitely long feeds, write it back to the network, and then at the end of the write, whatever system we're writing it to then has to do a second replication hop to make sure that we're getting it durably onto a second set of machines. And so for every write that we're actually doing, for every delivery that we're doing, we actually incur 3x whatever the size of the feed is across the network. And so this clearly wasn't gonna work for us. You know, we could do single gigabit between each of the nodes fairly e easily, going much beyond single gigabit between every one of the nodes in the cluster was gonna start getting really expensive. And in addition, the 200 megabyte number was really only for single delivery. So at a certain point, we're gonna hit a large number of concurrent high fan out deliveries. That problem just gets worse and worse and worse. At some point, we start backing up deliveries. It's going to become an even bigger problem for us. Users are gonna start seeing big delays in delivery times. And so what we're gonna to have to start looking at is how do we deal with data locality? How do we make it so that we don't have to go and hit the network for as much of this stuff? Uh, keep the latencies low, stick to high bandwidth IO systems. The network, despite all the advances that there have been over the last 10 or 15 years, is still very high latency and low bandwidth compared to things like memory and the disk. Uh, so we began thinking much more seriously about embedded solutions. And so that's really what began our journey with uh, Berkeley DB. Um, Coda, our architect, had been talking to some folks at LinkedIn about the use of Berkeley DB with Voldemort. And what we learned was that all the pieces that we needed to build what we wanted were sort of already there in the box in Berkeley DB, uh, things like replication and whatnot. And so we gave it a go. And so we'll talk a little bit about what Berkeley DB is so that you get a sense for what's actually available. Uh, to start with Berkeley, is, Berkeley DB, it's an on-disk log structured B plus tree. Um, this makes it very easy to reason about. Everything goes into a directory on the file system. It's just a bunch of logs. They get sequentially written to by the system. There, there are a lot of tools to back this up. In the easiest case, you just take rsync and you copy the log files off. Because it's uh, append only, it's very simple to just copy the files off and not have to worry about too much. Uh, there's a lot of command line tools that come with Berkeley DB for interacting with the log files. Um, and the append only nature makes it, it gives you some very positive performance benefits in terms of you don't have to deal with uh, doing um, random access on the disk. It's a lot of sequential writes. Um, the B plus part of the B plus tree means that the tree is actually ordered in such a way or it's structured in such a way that it's very easy to traverse all the keys in order. So if you're building data models where you actually want to be able to scan parts of your, uh, part of the table, uh, it's very easy to do this in Berkeley DB, and that was important for us for the messaging database. We actually needed to be able to say, I want to start at the head of the feed, and I want to scan down to the end of the feed and return a block of 50, 100, 1,000, whatever messages out of it. Single master replication is built into Berkeley DB. Um, the master node ships transactions to all the replica nodes uh, in the replication group. Uh, at the application level, you don't actually know that replication is happening unless by chance there's a failure during the replication, in which case an exception gets thrown. Uh, but your code doesn't actually have to know that replication is happening, so you just get it for free. Um, single master does mean that only one node gets to write at a time. Uh, the replicas can only do reads. This will cause some problems later on, which we'll, I'll talk about how uh, we ended up working around some of those issues. Uh, it comes with automatic leader election and failover. Uh, it uses Paxos algorithms for doing automatic leader election. Um, if the current master decides to go walkies, right, a, you've blown a hard drive, you've blown a power supply, the machine has inexplicably gone for a five second garbage collection, uh, the other members of the replication group will take note that the master has left and go ahead and elect a new master. Um, part of what this involves is doing uh, quorum elections. Uh, and so Berkeley DB, because it does quorum elections, it ends up preventing cases where you can end up in a uh, sort of a split brain situation where you have two masters, you're doing rights to both sides. Uh, it has 
uh, it allows for configurable durab durability and consistency guarantees. Uh, the durability guarantees allow you to wait, decide how long you want to wait for a write uh, on the master to be written locally. And so what you can do is you can tell it, uh, don't wait at all. I don't care about durability quite as much with this. Uh, we have some applications for which they're writing data as it's coming in. We don't care as much about dropping a few events here and there, and so we don't have to worry about things like, let's wait until it's made it to the file system buffers, or let's wait until it's made it all the way down to the disk. Uh, you can say that you want to wait until it's at least flushed to the file system buffer. Uh, this means that you can at least make sure that if you have an application level failure, that the data is at least going to be made, it will make its way out of the application into the operating system. Uh, or you can say that you want to wait until there's a full F sync that's been done, so that you have some level of reassurance that it's made it to the disk. Um, there's by no means any guarantee. Uh, we know some of our RAID controllers, because they have buffers, the F-Sync doesn't mean it's actually made it all the way to the disk. Um, but at the, at the level of the VM, it's about the biggest guarantee that you have that it's durably to the disk. The consistency guarantees allow you to decide how many nodes in the replication group have to acknowledge the write before it can be considered successful. Uh, you can say none if you don't really care that the write has made it off to the network. Um, you can say you want to wait for it to make it to all of the nodes in the replication group, or you can say that you want to wait for it to make it to the quorum. So, Quorum is kind of the, it's kind of the best of the both worlds between none and all. Uh, Quorum allows you to say in a three node cluster that only two hosts have to acknowledge it. And what this ultimately means is the master in one replica. And so this means that if you have one replica that happens to be really, really slow, you don't have to wait for the slow replica. You can wait for the, the fast replica to act the right. Uh, most of the operations can happen in memory or on disk uh, with the exception of replication. Uh, replication is always going to hit the network, uh, but reads and writes can be limited to memory in sort of the best case, um, and in the worst case, just the disk. Uh, but even the disk is going to be a lot faster than the network in most cases. Um, BDB cache sizing and playing with the consistency and the durability controls uh, will allow you to control these factors. So in certain cases, if you turn down durability and consistency low enough, you can make sure that all of your writes, at least for the main thread of your application, never have to actually wait for the network or never have to wait for the disk, uh, which means that you can relax how exactly how consistent you want your data to be in exchange for lower latencies. Uh, there's actually a few different versions of Berkeley DB. Uh, rest assured, we're not using the C version. Uh, we're actually using the native Java version. Uh, we're not using the JNI bindings to the C version. Um, the pure Java version is much better when it comes to concurrent access. Uh, the C version, even though it's native, can be quite slow when it comes to dealing with multi-threaded access. Uh, it's a library. It ships as a jar. Um, we call it from Java. We call it from Scala. Uh, we package it directly into our jar files. Um, the very nice thing about this is that we can actually profile it and debug it as part of the application. So if you imagine writing an application that talks to something like Postgres or MySQL, um, and say you wanted to set a breakpoint inside of Postgres, you can't set a breakpoint inside of Postgres with your application, not very easily anyway. Um, with BDB, you can actually get access to the source code, tie it into your IDE, set a breakpoint down inside of Berkeley DB, and see exactly the path of execution, the data that's getting passed down. Uh, in addition, if you want to run a profiler against your application, it's very easy to see what's happening inside of BDB, whereas with something like Postgres, you have no visibility, right? If you're profiling an application that's talking to Postgres, you see 98% of your time is spent talking over the socket. Inside of Berkeley DB, because it's embedded, you see 98% of your time is spent waiting on this particular lock. Uh, it's an open source library, which always comes in handy. Uh, this means one of the big benefits is you can use it for free. Uh, the one thing that you give up is Oracle support. Uh, Oracle will make you pay, and they'll make you pay handsomely for support, even if you're not redistributing anything. Uh, the source means you can easily set breakpoints. So I was saying you can tie it into your IDE. Uh, it's very easy to go in and set a breakpoint if you know a particular part of the source code um, where you're experiencing problems. Um, it also means that you're free to mess around with BDB if necessary. So if you find bugs and you find that you're not getting a good enough turnaround uh, from the open source parts of Oracle, um, you can go in and fix it, make your own builds of Berkeley DB. The development model is fairly simple. Um, you have an environment which consists of many databases. Uh, this can be a somewhat awkward nomenclature if you're used to a more of a SQL background. Um, if you're in a SQL back, if you're from a more of a SQL background, what Berkeley DB calls an environment, you'd call a database, and what Berkeley DB calls a database, you'd call a table. Um, so keep that in mind as I, as I mention environments and databases from here on out, that they're flipped a little bit from the SQL world. Uh, environments are represented as directory of log files. So this is where I mentioned before that it's a on-disk log structured B plus tree. Um, there's one set of log files per environment, not per database. All the database, if you think about Berkeley DB as just one big B tree, the root node represents the environment, and then there's child nodes for each of the databases. So each of the databases is just one branch of the tree. Uh, 
if you wanted to peel data for a particular database out of the log files, you'll end up having to use the provided command line tools or to build your own, uh, neither of which is particularly difficult. Um, each replication group, each environment is a, is a member of the replication group. Uh, environments are really the base unit of replication. So anything that you do inside of an environment is gonna get replicated over to other hosts. So if you make a change in database A, database D, B, database C, those are all gonna get replicated out together. It doesn't replicate the databases independently of one another. Uh, I mentioned before, leader election requires quorum consensus. Uh, this helps to prevent split brain scenarios. Uh, split brain scenarios are never good for databases where you have single master access, um, particularly in the log structured systems where you end up having all the systems in one, in one replication group right into the log system. At some point they split off, you make split brains and then they have essentially a fork of the transaction stream. Uh, Berkeley DB uses quorum consensus to make sure that this can't happen. So if you imagine that you have uh, a six node cluster and you have some sort of a network uh, split and you have three hosts on one side and three hosts on the other side, a quorum is considered one half plus one. And so in a six node cluster, you'd actually need four hosts to form a quorum. And so if you have three hosts on one side and three hosts on the other side, you can't actually elect a master. Uh, if you have a three node cluster and you put two nodes on one side and one node on the other side, the two nodes on the one side of the split can still elect a new master and can proceed, whereas the one host on the other side can't actually elect a new master, it can't do any rights until the, uh, the split is resolved and that one host can rejoin the replication group. One thing that comes up as a result of this is that you really need to take great care to monitor the state of your replication groups. So if the health of your replication groups is such that you're losing hosts, uh, it can make it very difficult to elect a master. So in a three node cluster, you can lose an individual host and still be able to elect a new master, but the minute you lose two, you can't elect a new master anymore, you can't accept any more rights until you get at least one of the hosts back up and running. Uh, each database is a very simple byte array to byte array key value store. It's just a big hash map that takes a blob as a key and a blob as the value. Uh, BDB mostly doesn't care or know what it exactly it is that you're storing. Uh, this means that you'll have to do your own object serialization. So whatever you have as your object model, you have to decide how exactly you want to represent that as bytes. Berkeley DB does have this thing called the direct persistence layer, which helps out with some of this, but it takes away a lot of the flexibility in serializing your objects. Uh, so we've largely avoided using it. Um, there's a lot of optimizations that we can take advantage of by writing our own serializers. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. The tree is ordered by byte to byte, byte by byte comparisons of the keys. So by default, when you're writing the keys, it'll take whatever keys you have and compare them one byte at a time in order to figure out how do I actually want to sort the values in this B tree. If you were actually to open a cursor from the start and scan to the end, how exactly you're going to order this. And this, this has implications for when you're building your serializers to make sure that if you want to be able to traverse your tree in any given order, that you serialize the bytes in the order that you want them to be compared by. Um, you can do duplicate keys if you configure them. Uh, if you can configure Berkeley DB that way. Um, in addition, you can, you can use a custom key comparator. Uh, if you decide that you don't want to use the byte by byte comparisons and you want to have something a bit more complex, uh, you can implement your own. Uh, it's something that I would say to leave for the more brave among you. Um, there are some consequences to using it, namely that Berkeley DB will actually take whatever comparator that you supply and serialize it into the database. And then anytime you try to open the database, it's going to actually want that class declaration around to be able to open it. Uh, so if, for instance, uh, the machine goes down, you want to bring it back up with the command line tools, uh, the command line tools are going to demand to know where your jar is at so that it can actually load the data so that it knows how to compare all the keys. Uh, it gets a bit awkward, um, but you, as I mentioned before, you can realize some pretty serious gains if you end up doing uh, some trickery with the keys. Transaction support is built in and works across the databases. So you can, just like any other uh, database technology, you can start a transaction, you can modify uh, keys and values in several different databases, and then either commit or, or abort the transaction. Uh, that works across all the replication. It'll make sure to abort the transaction on all the other hosts. So it's single master, so how is that really any better than Postgres? So Postgres and MySQL each have single master replication stories that you can use um, but it doesn't really solve your horizontal scalability story, right? Single master means that at some point um, you're gonna have to figure out how to do writes to other machines if you actually wanna be able to spread out the write load. And so the answer is that we run a ton of Berkeley DBs. Uh, so rather than just run one Berkeley DB instance, we end up running, <clears throat> in, in the case of our messaging database, we run 256 Berkeley DBs. And we do 3 row replication, which means we have a total of 768 partitions. Uh, each environment or each partition contains a slice of all of our networks. 
uh, where a network represents an actual a company that's paying us to use Yammer. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll actually take the network ID and we partition based on that to figure out which one of the 256 partitions does this company's data belong on. We take those partitions and we put them on a ton of machines. And so in the case of the messaging database, we're running it on 45 machines. Uh, 45 machines, some are 68 partitions, means we're hosting about 17 partitions per machine. Uh, and these aren't super beefy machines. These are nothing like the database machines that we're currently running with Postgres today. Um, they are 16 core 2U boxes with 24 gigs of RAM uh, and a terabyte of RAID 10 uh, storage. And so these are super easy to replace and deploy quickly if we end up losing a box. Uh, we've had instances in the past where we've lost entire boxes and been able to get them back up and running pretty quickly because the boxes are mostly commodity, right? We can have a stack of these laying around, re-rack them, get them set up, get them reprovisioned, get the application software redeployed to it, and then get them to join all the replication groups to get the, the partitions that have been lost uh, back up to three, uh, three copies. Uh, we scale by adding more machines. Uh, so if utilization is low, we can actually pare back the number of machines. So we could take the 45 machines and we could pare down to 22 or 23 machines and simply double the partition count on all the boxes. If the utilization is high, we could go and we could double from 45 to 90 machines and cut partitions from 17 down to eight or nine per box. And so this way we can sort of elastically uh, spread our workload out across all the, all the machines. Um, the way that it's set up right now, we could theoretically scale out to 768 machines before we really start encountering any problems. At 768 machines, we've got one partition per box, and at that point, the only limitation is how much, how big of a partition we can physically fit on the machine. Uh, which brings up another problem, is, which is at some point, we may actually encounter a single partition that can't actually be housed on an individual box. Uh, and so one of the things that we've been considering is uh, the ability to do partition splitting. Uh, so the ability to say, this, this one partition is too big for a single machine, Let's take the partition, let's split it down into eight sub-partitions and put that across eight separate machines. We haven't actually built the code to do the splitting itself, but we have left ourselves a back door so that it'd be very easy for us to figure out for a given key on the box, can we figure out which sub-partition it would go to if we were to partition it? So we've sort of, we've, we've hopefully kicked the can far enough down the road that we hope to never have to do this, but if we do, we've sort of left ourselves an out to be able to do it. So we take, all the Berkeley DB components and we front it with Drop Wizard. Drop Wizard is a library that we've built in house for doing all of our RESTful web services uh, on the JVM. And then we've also built a second reusable management and routing layer for Berkeley DB. Uh, this really sort of abstracts all the wrangling for Berkeley DB into a reusable library so that we can deal with making sure that the Berkeley DBs are spun up on the boxes. Um, we've taken that reusable library and we've actually used it to spin out five additional services in addition to the messaging database. Um, it, at this point, it's, it's so incredibly easy for us to build new stuff on top of Berkeley DB that it may almost be a fault, but we start putting a lot of stuff under Berkeley DB that could maybe go into other things. Uh, so we're starting to evaluate how much stuff we want to put into Berkeley DB going forward in the future, um, especially we were required by Microsoft back in uh, July. There's a lot of technologies that they have that we may start to leverage uh, to replace a little bit of some of the Berkeley DB stuff we've been doing. The management layer that we built ensures the necessary partitions run on the necessary machines. So it's able to check the state of the local environments. It's able to alert if there are any unnecessary partitions that are present on the box. It's able to alert if there are any necessary partitions that are missing on the box. Uh, it's able to start and stop partitions on the box. It's able to ask a box to leave or to join given replication groups uh, as instructed by an operator. So it's very easy using this layer to be able to say, I want you to begin replicating with these other two machines, partition number 48. I want you to leave partition 50. This way we can very easily rebalance data across all the hosts. Uh, the routing layer proxies reads to the replicas and it proxies writes to the masters, uh, which means it, the, the cluster itself actually has a very nice property of you can send a request to any box in the cluster and the box will make sure that that request goes to the right machine. Uh, this has a really nice side effect that the load balance story for this becomes really simple, right? You set up a load balancer, you tell it to round robin all the machines in the cluster. At this point, request hits the load balancer, load balancer picks a machine at random, it hits that machine. That machine then says, this request appears to be destined for partition 19. I don't have partition 19, so I'm gonna find one of the hosts that does and I'm gonna proxy the request to that host. That host receives the request and says, oh, this is a write for partition 19. Am I the master? No, I'm not. Who's the master? Okay, this host is the master, so I'm gonna proxy it one more time to the master. So we do multi-hop to make sure that we get it to, their, to the right host. Uh, we do it transparently by proxying. We have some code in there to make sure that we're not proxy hopping all over the place. We're not creating proxy loops. Um, 
but it's a very nice story for being able to write clients against this. You just generate an HTTP request, you send it to the load balancer, load balancer eventually ends up hopping into the right host, the request gets handled, and it pops out the response at the other end. Uh, the routing table, uh, management of the routing table took some time to get stable. Um, this is actually what I probably spent the last two months of the project on, maybe a month and a half. Um, we started out originally with Zookeeper. Uh, Zookeeper seemed like kind of a nice choice for this. We could use ephemeral nodes, uh, have it so that when each node comes up, it ends up uh, by, it connects to Zookeeper and says, I am currently the master for this partition and the replica for these partitions. Have all the nodes join Zookeeper. Everyone can look at Zookeeper to see who's got what partitions. Uh, it seemed like a really nice story. It turns out that Zookeeper is not terribly good at this. Uh, Zookeeper has some pretty, from the client aspect, Zookeeper is very difficult to deal with errors. It's very difficult to sort of figure out when you've lost your connection. It's very difficult to figure out when you finally reestablish your connection, how many of your ephemeral nodes are actually gone now. Uh, and it became a major headache trying to keep everything consistent, trying to end up recovering during the error conditions. And so we switched from that to using Berkeley DB's replication groups so that we could actually ask Berkeley DB, hey, you're the source of truth. Why don't you tell me who's a member of these replication groups? The problem with this architecture is that every host then has this, it's, it's this weird star architecture of every node connects to every replication group to find out every member of the replication groups. And so you've got massive numbers of connections running all over the boxes. Uh, in addition, the, the Berkeley DB tools for connecting to the replication group and just listing out who are all the members, who's the master, has sort of the same problems that Zookeeper had of these weird, these weird conditions around, you run into this error, how do you actually get yourself back into the good state? Um, and so we put that one by the side. The last one that we tried that didn't work was JGroups, which we really poked our eyes out on quite badly. Um, JGroups is this really nice multicast library for doing mesh networks. Um, it seems like it should be wonderful. And when we did our early testing, it was working really nicely. When we started pumping any amount of actual traffic through, what we would see is the group would mesh up all 45 hosts, and then at some point, like five hosts would split out. And then those five hosts would come back, and then two hosts would split out, and the two hosts would come back, and 15 hosts would split out, and 15 hosts would come back. Uh, and this made it very difficult to sort of manage the hash table that indicated these are the members of each of the replication groups. Um, and so JGroups was sort of the last one that we threw by the side, and at some point we just said, you know what, screw it, we're just gonna do flat files. Uh, we're just gonna make a file, we're gonna write it by hand, we're gonna say that you know, this host is a member of these partitions, this host is a member of these partitions. Uh, when we have to, we'll simply update that file, we'll push it out, we'll have the application server go ahead and reread it in when it sees the changes. Um, and this has actually worked really, really well. Um, it's sort of missing a lot of the dynamic and a lot of the automatic uh, aspects of the other systems that we wanted, but it hasn't actually been enough of a headache we've gone back to deal with it. Um, so that's what we've stuck with from now. The services that we actually implement on top of this BDB uh, reusable layer um, they only have to implement three things, which is really nice. Uh, this is part of why we've been able to sort of cookie cutter stamp out lots of new services on top of it. And the first thing that they have to build is URI hash key extraction. So I mentioned before the routing system, as it takes in a request, it's able to figure out from the URI which partition that request is bound for. And the way that it does this is when the request comes in, a request filter grabs the URI, passes it off to some bit of the application specific code and says, what part of this URI do you want me to hash the request on? It responds with a string, we hash it, we bucket it, and we say, oh, this particular request needs to go to partition 19. So all the application has to do is figure out, given the URI, what part do I want you to hash on? And so for the messaging database, what we do is we actually encode the network ID in every one of our URLs, and that's what we end up hashing on. The second thing that needs to be built is the data model and the associated serializations. Uh, you know, only your application knows what your data model is, so we can't actually put that into the common layer, we have to do it in the application layer. Uh, in addition, we have some good base serializers in the reusable layer, uh, but there are oftentimes a lot of things in the application layer where you can do specific optimizations for how you want to store data. Um, some of the examples of things that we've done, uh, variable length integer encoding or variable length long encoding. So instead of actually storing a long as a full sequence of eight bytes, being able to say, you know what, the first four bytes of this are all zeros. Uh, why don't we just compress that down to the four bytes that aren't zeros? Uh, this has implications we'll talk about later on in terms of BDB cache sizing. Uh, another thing that we end up doing is we end up doing delta compression. And delta compression paired with doing a variable length encoding allows us to say we have a length, or we have a, a sequence of numbers. Let's go ahead and take the first number, subtract the second number from it, and so we'll store the first number raw, and we'll store the diff to the second number, and then the diff to the third number, and the diff to the fourth number, and the diff to the sixth number. And because the diffs are usually much smaller than the numbers themselves, they variable length encode very well. Um, the last one that we really do is what we call paging. 
Um, this is something that we've actually seen the, uh, the Voldemort team does as well, which is uh, instead of actually storing a sequence in VDB as one key per entry in the sequence, storing a key for an entire page of the sequence. Uh, and this ends up crunching down the number of keys that you actually have to store in the system. Uh, it gets a little bit unwieldy when you have to actually traverse a sequence because you have to pull the page out, you have to you know, deserialize the page, look through it, and then figure out if you want to pull out the next page. Uh, writes become a little bit more complicated. However, it ends up dramatically uh, crunching down the key space that you have to actually store. The third thing that you have to build as a service is your RESTful resources. And so this is where you go into Drop Wizard and you say, I've got a, I've got a message delivery resource. Uh, it has a method, it takes, a, uh, it takes an HTTP post, uh, it has the following URI parameters, it has the following query parameters. Uh, this is where you actually implement your business logic that says, when this particular post comes in, I want to pull out this part of the request, I want to write to BDB, I want to pull some of the data out of BDB and do the response. When I get a re uh, get request, I want to go into BDB and read this out and I want to write it back out. The very nice thing about this is that the reusable BDB layer, it knows who's the master, it knows who are the replicas, it can make sure that all the posts, all the puts, and all the deletes only get routed to requests, or to hosts that are the masters, uh, which means that at the point that you're writing the RESTful resources, you don't have to do any checking that says, oh wait, this is a delete request, I should check and make sure I'm the master. You don't actually have to worry about that. The routing layer upstream will handle that for you, which means that your REST resources actually become very, very clean. Uh, and that's it. That's that's all that you have to do in our in our model for actually building uh, a system on top of it. Um, we, in the end, we end up outsourcing the reliable storage and replication to Berkeley DB. Um, we're not a database company. We don't employ database experts. These are sort of the really, really hard parts of building a database. Um, these are the parts that would have been very easy for us to get wrong. Um, so it's very important that we outsource this, right? We don't get paid to ship databases. We get paid to ship features in Yammer. Um, Limiting the time that we spend working perpendicular to that was very important to us. So this is really where Berkeley DB has been a big win for us, is that it's, it's supplied most of our needs and sort of gotten us 80% of the way there. Um, we end up building routing and management ourselves. Um, you know, where we're not sort of database experts, we are pretty good when it comes to HTTP. Uh, we understand how to get an HTTP request from one box to the next. Um, so spending a bit of time here was actually very valuable for us. Uh, we got to tweak a lot of the system. We got to do some optimizations here. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's not a lot of wasted effort to spend some time here for us. Uh, it's currently about 6,000 lines of Java, the reusable component of it. Um, so it's not a very big code base for us. Uh, it was about 4,000 lines of Scala before we ported it. Um, so a bit of the 6,000 lines is just sort of Java expressiveness as opposed to Java actually doing anything. Uh, there's a long thread on one of our blog entries for why we moved from Scala to Java. Um, short version is that we spent way too much time dealing with Scala compiler issues. Um, so in translation, we're not totally insane. Um, you know, we didn't build a database just to build a database. We didn't build the hard parts of the database. Um, we built something that we've been able to reuse a large number of times, right? Um, so as, you know, as crazy as it sounds, this wasn't a terrible idea for us. Some of you may have heard there's a product called Oracle NoSQL. Um, Oracle built their own NoSQL database also on top of Berkeley DB Java Edition. Um, it shares a lot of things in common with what we've built. Uh, and so, you know, why didn't we end up using that? One of the big reasons is it didn't come out until shortly after we had actually deployed our solution. Um, the other thing is that they didn't really embrace the embedded nature of Berkeley DB. Uh, they took Berkeley DB and they built yet another client server. And so this was going to have the exact same problems that we had with Postgres, the same problems that we had with Reoc, where we're going to be doing all these network round trips to be able to pull in all this data. It's going to be high latency for us. Um, I kind of wish they had sort of kept with the embedded solution. Um, they, that's sort of one of the nicest things about Berkeley DB is the fact that you can keep it embedded, you can keep the data and the code very close to one another. Uh, the other thing that they did, which is a total head scratcher in 2012, is that the only way to talk to it is RMI. Um, so if you're Rails, if you're Corba, if you're Erlang, if you're anything that does not run on the JVM, you simply cannot talk to it. Um, they say it was in the name of latency, but we've really not had a problem making HTTP go plenty fast and everything can talk to HTTP. So. Um, we built some stuff on this. Uh, I mentioned the messaging database and several other services that we built. Um, I wanted to dive into two of them really quickly um, just to go over what exactly they do and go over some of the performance metrics. Um, and so we mentioned the messaging database, which is sort of what got us all to this point to begin with. Um, and here's the HTTP GET requests that are coming into it. Uh, realistically, it's sort of peaking at around 30,000 GETs a second. Uh, remember that it's doing all the routing, so a lot of this is multi-hop, so you really have to cut it in half because the first half, the first hop is probably going to be a proxy hop to the, to the actual work hop. Uh, so it's doing about 15,000 reads a second. Uh, these are mostly feed reads and counter reads um, going across all 45 hosts. 
Uh, the last two weeks, it's two times our typical baseline. Uh, we can mostly ignore that. Uh, we're currently having some problems with some misbehaving clients that are in a tight polling loop. Um, so normally it's 15,000. Uh, this is the 95th percentile for the get requests, uh, which is about seven or eight milliseconds across all 45 hosts. Uh, it stays pretty flat. Uh, this includes the proxied connections. Uh, so this includes not just the call that actually does the work, but the call that makes the call to do the work. Um, so the proxy hop is not actually costing us a lot of time in this. The proxy hop is almost zero cost to us. Um, it's not really significant enough for us to be concerned about the fact that we're making extra hops in this. Uh, I'm showing the last day because I was looking at the last week and we have some periodic spikes that sort of make ganglia almost useless to actually look at the numbers. Uh, I think most of those are related to GC pauses because they're very short and they, they drop back off. Uh, these are message deliveries. Um, it's about eight message deliveries a second at peak, which seems like a supremely unimpressive number. Um, it is an unimpressive number until you start thinking about the fan out. Uh, this is actual message delivery. So you go into Yammer, you type a message, you hit send. That's one of these. Um, in reality, that needs to get delivered, like I said, to tens, hundreds, maybe even thousands, tens of thousands of feeds. And so if we actually look at it at a feed delivery basis, we're doing about 300 to 350 feed deliveries per second. Um, it's no Facebook, but it's a start. Uh, and here's the 95th percentile feed, late, feed delivery latency. Uh, in most cases, most of the hosts are solidly below one millisecond. I think we're down around uh, 300 microseconds per feed delivery. Um, you can see we've got one host, this brown host, uh, which is persistently an outlier right now. Um, I think that's actually the one hosting Microsoft.com. Uh, we, during the acquisition, we got a lot of them onboarded, so they've seen really explosive uh, growth and engagement and users. Uh, so we think that's what's causing some of the outliers there. Uh, one of the other systems that we built is an entity ranking database. Uh, it ranks the relevance from one entity type to the other. Um, so, for instance, one of the things that we do with this is we say which groups are most relevant to a given user so that we can use that and say which groups do we want to suggest to a given user. We also look at things like which messages are most relevant within an individual group uh, and so on. Uh, it's in the critical read path for a lot of our user facing stuff. Uh, so this one has uh, much higher demands on making sure that it's very, very fast. Uh, it also gets written to on virtually every action. So it sees a higher write rate than the uh, messaging database does. Um, and so here's the get ranks. Get rank sees about 4,500 maybe uh, requests per second coming into the three boxes. Um, the 95th percentile read on this one is about 100 microseconds. Uh, so this one's significantly faster than the other system. So you know, whoever tells you HTTP can't be made to go fast, uh, they're, they're lying. Um, HTTP can go plenty fast. Um, we haven't even really spent that much time trying to optimize this one. Uh, this system is actually benefiting quite a lot from the fact that the data set that it has can actually fit entirely into RAM. Uh, and this is one of the main benefits that we have with using an embedded solution is that we don't have to hit the network for this. We don't even have to hit, have to hit the disk for this. We can just go straight to RAM and get the data out of it. Uh, this is add event. This is all the writes that are going into the system. Uh, we're doing 30 to 35 at peak per second. Um, you'll notice that it's all skewed to one color in this case. Uh, the color represents an individual host. Uh, in this case, we have three hosts behind this particular cluster, and one host happens to be master for every partition at the moment. Um, BDB does not have a great way to say, I want to shift mastership from this host to this host. About the only thing you can do is stop the partition on a given host, let it move over to another host, but you can't really pick which host you want it to move to. Uh, Berkeley DB is a bit fickle in sort of making sure that when it does the leader elections, it wants to make sure that whoever gets elected is out of the remaining hosts, the one that's furthest along in the, uh, the log stream. Uh, and so it's very difficult to just sort of say, you give up mastership, you pick up mastership. Uh, it hasn't really been a big issue for us, so we haven't really pressed the issue, but it's a thing that we've brought up with Oracle that it would be nice to have. Uh, this is the ad event latency, um, P95 of 1.2 milliseconds on write. Um, this actually includes uh, waiting on the axe from at least one of the replicas. So this is including the network hop of when you do the write, waiting for the replication to make it to at least one of the two other machines. Uh, so you know, for us, Berkeley DB is pretty nice for us most of the time. Um, you know, it may sound a little bit like we're sort of painting it as you know, it's all rainbows and unicorns with Berkeley DB. It isn't always. Um, you know, I do want to scare you just a little bit with this. Um, we've gotten where we are so far by you know, mostly grinding our way through some fairly serious issues, uh, which I'll talk a few, about a few of them right now. Um, watch your Berkeley DB internal cache size. Uh, the cache is something I keep mentioning, I keep bringing it up. 
uh, it was the biggest issue we had when we initially launched the messaging database. Uh, we, we launched it with one message, with one, um, uh, with one data model. That data model blew up pretty badly for us. Um, the way that it manifested itself was we had completely filled up the cache. We were constantly evicting things out of the cache. Uh, we were constantly going back to the disk to get things. When we actually went and ran the cache sizing tool, what we found was that we were going to need something on the order of 200 gigabytes of RAM on each box uh, for that particular data model. And so we had to actually go back to the drawing board, look at our data model, and figure out, you know, is it a problem that the keys are too big, or do we simply have too many of them? And in this case, we had too many of them. Uh, we were storing, for every feed delivery, one individual key. And so this is where we ended up doing that paging model that I discussed before. So now instead of doing one key per delivery, now we're actually storing a page of deliveries uh, for the system. And this ended up, you know, instead of having, we kept feeds at 10,000 messages. Uh, instead of, so instead of having 10,000 keys for each feed, now we compress down to maybe 200 keys. Um, we do this by paging. Uh, so you know, really watch out for the size of your keys uh, and the number of the keys that you're storing in the system. More JVM heap is not always better. Uh, so we talk about the fact that you have this Berkeley DB cache and you're like, oh my god, Berkeley DB has this cache, it makes things go faster. I'll just give all of my, all, all, the, all the RAM on the box to the JVM so that it can give it to the BDB heap, or to the BDB cache. Uh, what we end up finding then is that all of our IO operations, they suck. They suck really bad. And so what we started doing was we started skewing it so that we give 50% of the RAM on the box to the JVM. Most of that goes to the BDB cache. The other 50% we just leave. We let, that, we let the OS use that for file system buffers. Uh, and this has really found kind of a really nice sweet spot for most of our services. Uh, what we find now today is that due to growth of the product of Yammer, more users, more activity, uh, we find that the BDB cache requirements are getting to be a little bit bigger. We're having to start to chew in a little bit into some of that file system cache to ensure that we can hold all the internal nodes of the B tree in, in the cache. Uh, at some point, this is going to push us enough that we're going to have to start putting more boxes on so that we can rebalance some of the partitions and get back to more of that 50-50 split so that we have plenty of file system cache. Do not piss off the cleaner. Um, Berkeley DB, it's a log structured file system. Uh, when you write to a key that goes in to one of the log files, when you update the key, a new entry goes into one of the log files. You update that key, a new entry goes into the log files. It starts tombstoning some of the old ones. Eventually, one of the log files will reach the, um, the utilization threshold, so it'll say, only 50% of the entries in this file are actually live. The rest of them are all tombstoned. Therefore, I'm going to begin scanning this file. I'm going to look for the live entries. I'm going to copy them to the end of the log, and then I'm going to delete this file. So it can start compressing and cleaning up after itself. Uh, when we were actually migrating the data from Postgres into the new database, we were just constantly overwriting keys. We were constantly creating garbage off the end for the cleaner. The one thing about Berkeley DB's cleaner is that it's very IO intensive, and it's very lock intensive. So if you're constantly incurring the cleaner, it will grab all sorts of locks in the system. And it doesn't just grab them on individual keys, it grabs them at this higher level, which it calls the bottom, or the, uh, the internal nodes, um, which can actually grab a range of keys. Um, so be very wary of systems that just constantly run in the cleaner. If you have something that's using uh, very high write throughput, you have to be very cautious of this. Uh, getting access to metrics to plug into your own system can be quite difficult. Uh, BDB has its own metric system. It ends up exposing a lot of stuff via JMX. We don't actually use JMX for doing collection. We use our own uh, much better uh, metrics library for doing this. Um, the, the way that you hook into metrics means that we can only really hook in at gauges. We can't actually look at things like the M1 rate for things. We can only look at what's the current value that Berkeley DB has measured for a given thing. What's the cache eviction rate? What's the count of a thing that's happened? So it becomes very difficult to sort of look at changes over time. And so a lot of the counters, a lot of things that come out of it are just these straight counters that keep incrementing. Um, the other thing that can happen is Berkeley DB exposes a lot of metrics at the environment and the database level. So if you have, if your data model has a lot of databases and you run lots of partitions on the boxes, you run into this multiplier effect where every one of the boxes is generating hundreds if not thousands of metrics. If you have this sort of very aggressive nature of grabbing metrics and throwing them off into a system like, say, Ganglia, um, you can very easily bring Ganglia down. So when we initially launched the messaging database, we were throwing so many data points into Ganglia that all of a sudden we got a call from the operations team saying, what just happened to Ganglia? We just took a look at the system. It's pegged. Uh, we can't get in. All that we notice is that the data points just you know, quadrupled from what they used to be as a whole. Um, so be a little bit careful with just blindly putting metrics into the system. Uh, what we've actually had to do is put regexes on the system that say, we only want these four particular metrics out of there. We want to look at the cleaner backlog. We want to look at evictions. We want to look at things like that. 
Um, some, tics, some tips and tricks for uh, what we've learned. Um, you know, some of these may be of interest even if you're not going to build your own database. Some of these are of interest even if you're just using a database. Um, get clever with your keys. The benefit to the BDB cache is high. We sort of talked a little bit about this, um, but things like the variable length encoding, delta compression, paging, um, you know, if you, can, if you can squeeze little bits here and there, it makes a tremendous difference in how much of the actual system you can fit into memory. Break BDB a lot before you go to production. Um, you know, the fact that it took us almost six months to get the system into production, uh, we spent probably the last two months breaking and rebreaking and rebreaking it. The thing you find out is you find out all the different ways in which BDB can break, and you find out all the different ways in which you can get BDB fixed at that point. Uh, this means when you go to production and the system actually breaks, you don't freak out. You're like, oh, I've seen this before. We do this, and it'll get back up and running. Uh, if you've also, if you've broken it before you go to production, you also know, oh, this particular break, we've built a fix for this, right? You don't end up in a situation where you go to production and you're like, oh, it's broken in a way that we don't know how to fix. Uh, this, I think, is generally applicable, right? This is not just a Berkeley DB thing. This is, we do this with a lot of the stuff that we deploy at Yammer today where we just make sure that we break the hell out of it. Uh, put a bell on it. Uh, we tried building a lot of automated recovery in Berkeley DB. Um, in a lot of cases, the automated recovery was making the, sis the situation actually worse. Um, you would think that it was going to be helping and then it would get itself caught in some weird loop where it would break, fix, break, fix, break, fix. Um, in reality, the, the fix would get caught in such a systemic problem that it was very difficult to actually get the, fix the automatic fixer turned off. And so you'd have to actually do a code push to get it turned off. At some point, we finally said, you know what, forget it. Let's just put a bell on everything that can possibly break. Um, we'll make sure that we know all the different ways a system can break. We'll make sure that we put it in the run book. We'll make sure that we put down the exact process for fixing anything that's broken. And if there's something that's going to break all the time, we'll have ops start putting back pressure on us saying, this thing breaks all the time. Can you guys start putting in automated fixes for this rather than try and guess up front what you need to automate? Uh, make sure you have the means to inspect the uh, replication groups. Uh, most of the problems that we run into are replication group problems. Uh, make sure that you can actually sort of peek into the system and see what the replication groups look like. Uh, you want to know, for instance, if there's been an orphaned host for a particular replication group so that you can go in and sort of pick it out of there so that it's not screwing with your quorum counts. Make some administration tools. Uh, you have just taken Postgres away from your operations team and you've given them some piece of software that you built yourself in six months. You've taken something that had really great documentation and really great tooling and you've given them this thing. Um, you will not make friends with your operations team if you don't actually give them the tools to administer this thing. Uh, you're not going to give them anything on par with Postgres, but you need to at least try and get close. Uh, get friendly with the Berkeley DB developers. Uh, there's a Berkeley DB Java Edition forum. Uh, the developers frequent that quite often, ask questions, answer questions. They're very good about giving you one-off jars if you happen to find problems and, you know, They'll go and they'll make a fix, they'll make a jar, and they'll say, hey, try this one out. It's not an official release, but try this out for us and let us know if this fixes the problem. Uh, they're very helpful people. Um, you really want to have them on your side. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I've thrown kind of a lot at you, so I want to wrap up a little bit. Um, we're not crazy, I promise. Um, you know, hopefully you've come to realize this during the presentation. If not, feel free to come up here and tell us that we're crazy. Um, we're, welcome to, we're open to discussion. Uh, BDB is pretty cool. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff with it with a little bit of assembly. Um, we are BDB trailblazers in a way. Uh, it may sound a little bit egotistical, but it's not really meant to be. Um, what I mean to say is that we're doing a lot of stuff that no one else is doing with Berkeley DB. Um, so we're kind of way out in the wilderness finding our own way with very little help from Oracle. So don't sort of think that this is something that people do on an everyday basis and that you're just going to run out into the wilderness um, and go charging into this. Uh, this is not really a path to be taken lightly. Um, so with that, I'm just about out of time, so I'll open up for some questions. Yeah? So your, your systems are all pretty much uh, uniform, and you can hit any one of them and they'll forward the request everywhere? <coughs> or do you have like, dedicate, like different like, types of servers? Yeah, so the question is whether or not the systems are fairly, um, whether everything's fairly uniform. Yes, the nodes are all uniform. In the case of the messaging database, like I said, it's 45 nodes. The hardware is exactly identical. Uh, the only difference is which partitions each one of the nodes runs. Uh, so the routing layer takes care of making sure that the request gets routed to a node that can actually handle it. Is that different It's all one thing. So the, the boxes that run the databases also run a web server right in front of it. I was wondering, um, uh, are you in multiple geographically distributed uh, data centers with this, or is this 
more of a, I'm looking at some of your latencies and kind of wondering. So Yammer itself is still a single data center at the moment. We're based out of San Jose right now. Um, it wasn't until the acquisition in July that we started receiving pressure to go multi-DC. Uh, multi-DC is a thing that we think we can do ourselves with Berkeley DB, but there's no assistance from Berkeley DB to do this. Uh, it's something that we've begun applying pressure to Oracle. Oracle knows they need to do it for Oracle NoSQL as well. Um, so there's no great story right now for multi-geographic regions. Uh, I wish there was. Basically, just that you uh, do the work on the master node, so all the writes hit the local disk first, and then they have to only go across the network once or twice for replication. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mentioned that we have that three x fan out on the network problem uh, with being able to actually move the move the execution to where the code and where the data actually lives. It means that we only have the one x cost. We only have the one replication hop cost uh, in terms of our latency. Um, there is essentially a 2x because we'll have to replicate it twice. Um, but because we only wait for the first one to finish, that's the only one that impacts our latency. And uh, about your uh, partitioning scheme that you use, mm -hmm. so it seems to me, kind of, based on your description, that's very similar to just sharding Postgres, right? Yeah. Is it different, or did you end up doing kind of the same thing as if you'd sharded Postgres? It's probably almost identical to how we would have sharded Postgres. Okay. Uh, the only difference is we've moved out of the client server model into the embedded model. Uh, you had mentioned uh, not making friends in ops, taking away documentation and tools. Uh, did you have a similar problem with uh, developers taking away their data models and select star from everything? No, so the, first of all, the developers who are building the new system didn't actually build the original system with a database. So we weren't really taking anything away from the, the new set of developers. Um, the new set of developers also, I mean, we really kind of took to it pretty well, I think. Um, you know, the fact that the fact that it's a very simple model, it's just a big, it's just big hash tables that you work against. Um, and the fact that we had built some really nice primitives around doing data serialization and codecs uh, really helped out quite a bit. So I don't think we really missed that so much. Uh, but we know the, op the ops team definitely missed a lot of the tools they used to have with Postgres. You know, they, could, they, they can easily go out and find a contractor to do Postgres administration. They can't find a contractor to come out and do BDB administration. Not in the way that we built it anyway. Is there a question up here? Uh, so reverse iterators versus iterators, it's not really something we've taken advantage of. Um, most of our stuff is built to be iterated one direction. Uh, I can't currently think of anything that we've built right now that iterates in both directions. Right, so the question was if, for moving data off of an individual machine. So there's sort of, there's two problems. There's the problem that we have today of, we have a machine with say 17 partitions and we need to split that up and move you know, half the partitions off to a new machine. Uh, that's not disruptive in any way. So what we do is we put a new box into the cluster, we put it behind the load balancer, we tell it to join half the replication groups from the other machine, at which point it begins replicating down, it becomes a replica for all those partitions. When that's completed, we go to the box that we want to leave and we tell it we want you now to leave those half, half of those partitions. It leaves and at that point, the, big, the only disruption you'll have at that point is if it's the master for any of those partitions. If it's the master for any of those partitions, you may have a couple second period where you have no master and so you can't do any writes. Uh, the reads will continue to go through on all the replicas. The master will have to wait until the, the uh, leader election completes. Uh, in the other case, the case where if it's one partition on a box and even that's too hot and we'll have to do the sub-partitioning, we haven't completely thought through it, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna end up being a very similar story to the other one of there'll be a short period when we do the leader elections where the writes will go offline but the reads should stay online. Yeah, 
Yeah, so one of the things that we've done, the question was whether GCs are an impact to the user experience. Um, all of our write paths are pretty much done through uh, workers that uh, do asynchronous work off of queues. So we have, uh, most of the work is done, or most of the work comes in into a Rails application. The Rails application then puts something off into RabbitMQ, a worker pulls that off and actually does the write work. So for a lot of the writes, the users don't actually notice that unless we back up the queues to the point at which we're really significantly delaying the work getting done. Uh, in terms of reads, one of the things that we've done is we've begun doing uh, some work there to make sure that we do latency leveling so that we can say, uh, I want you to fire a request to one of the rep replicas, and if it doesn't come back fast enough, fire a request off to the other replica, because one of them may be doing a garbage collection. It's unlikely that they're both doing a garbage collection. And so it doesn't completely take out the hump, but it's able to smooth the hump over just a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to just the way the zookeeper is built. Um, the, the biggest issue has to do with the fact that when you connect, you connect with a session timeout. And if you get disconnected, the server will essentially wait until the session timeout expires before it'll go ahead and nuke a lot of your ephemeral nodes. Uh, if you come back, you have to establish a new session. Uh, it gets very awkward then because the old session is sort of still hanging out there. Um, you don't actually receive any notification from the client library that the error has happened until, uh, until you finally reconnect, I think. Uh, there was a lot of really awkward behavior there. Um, so several months ago, I'd love to actually go back and revisit it. Uh, so I think we're pretty much out of time. If you have more questions, I'll be hanging out later on today if you want to come by and ask. Thanks a lot.